So uh, I'm talking about something which is more of a bedtime put you to sleep story, which are standards and guidelines. So I'll try to make it very brief and not too boring for you. Uh, we worked with the American Telemedicine Association, which in 2007 established some of the first guidelines for teledermatology. And we recently revised these through our American Telemedicine Association. The American Telemedicine Association is composed of a very large group of just not dermatologists, but individuals, healthcare institutions, companies, and other organizations. So there's a significant um, business aspect of this particular organization. Our mission is to promote improvement in healthcare delivery through telecommunications and information technology. And disseminating and developing these policies and standards is part of that mission. So we've now published 14 different guidelines, which are from <coughs> mental health to radiology to various subjects within telemedicine. But in teledermatology, we use these specific ones to try and guide us as we develop the new updated uh, teledermatology guidelines. Specifically, and these are all available at this website, and they're for free. Uh, we looked at the, the guidelines for live on-demand primary and urgent care and the core operational guidelines for telehealth services, which involve direct to patient uh, interactions, with which we're really dealing at this point. So why should we update the guidelines? Well, the most important thing was technology change, which has engulfed us in the last decade. Um, policy in the US varies from state to state. No state has the same policy with respect to the practice of telemedicine. Uh, the delivery of medical care is being shifted. Uh, MACRA, at this point, is uh, the Medicare Access and Chip Reauthorization Act of 2015. And, and the data is that maybe a third of our physicians might retire before they have to go through this uh, value-based way of charging for their services. Um, it creates a quality payment program. It's not going to be a fee-for-service program anymore. And this totally turns the way uh, medicine is reimbursed in the United States on its head. The other thing is that our patients want more. So it's already been uh, pointed out. They want it now. They want it where they want it. They want it when, when they want it. And, but there are only uh, a, a few dermatologists, as we've already demonstrated. There are constraints in the delivery of this uh, specialty care. In the US, two thirds of dermatology problems are seen by non dermatologists. So at this point, as Ann Burdick, who's in the audience, had pointed out several years ago, uh, this is what you have to get ready for. The teledermatology train is coming. Uh, get on board or get out of the way. And we're beginning to see this as our patients demand more of these services. The AAD was rather slow to jump on this train, but I think they're being forced to. For example, the Dermatology World, which is the official newsletter of the AAD, the American Academy of Dermatology, in 2015 was finally devoted to teledermatology. So this is a confusing slide, so I just uh, pointed to the, uh, the, the, the red part. The mobile internet is really what affects us. I mean, we're talking about disruptive technologies. That's a common uh, a, a subject now in terms of a driver of change. But the most disruptive technology with respect to us in medicine has been uh, the mobile internet. And the economic impact of this is estimated by 2025 to be four to $11 trillion annually in terms of the economic impact. So we're beginning, that's one of the reasons we're beginning to see not just the demand from our patients, but the, the multiplicity of vendors and people who are ready to deliver healthcare services directly to our patients, which is a change in the way we have delivered care. And there's the ubiquity of these devices. Um, it, it said there's a, a cell phone, a smartphone for almost every person on the planet at this point is what I've heard. So, and it, it's totally changed the way that we are looking at healthcare and at delivery. So increasingly, our patients are seeing this sort of thing. They're looking for online help. Yet, online help, or direct to patient, or consumer, as we've heard more and more, is the way the patients are being uh, viewed by businesses, uh, is not ready for prime time. And uh, I'm happy to give anybody the references if you don't have time to um, copy these down or take a picture of it. But basically, incorrect diagnoses, inappropriate treatments, lack of information about side effects and risk, lack of transparency about a doctor's credentials, 
These were among the concerns raised in a study of direct-to-patient teledermatology apps and sites. And a study of teledermatology apps showed that applications vary widely on data collection interfaces, their services, and their cost, with some risk of medical error. So that's why our team from the American Telemedicine Association Teledermatology Special Interest Group worked over the last year to revise these guidelines. Uh, they came from academia, industry, and clinicians. And I'm happy to say that five of us are here in this audience at this conference. So if you have questions about these guidelines, there are a lot of people to ask here. So our goals as we develop these were to be consistent with the other American Telemedicine Association guidelines for other specialties. We wanted to update the literature review, and our whole goal really was to try and create more teledermatology programs that could give our patients increased access to quality care, hopefully cost savings, and hopefully improved health outcomes. Uh, the focus as we made these changes was particularly to look at this explosion of direct patient care. And as a physician, I still want to use the word patient rather than consumer, uh, even though it seems to be changing. <laughs> Uh, we wanted to clarify the patient-physician relationship. You know, sometimes there's not one when you're doing it virtually. Uh, we wanted to clarify the use of these mobile dev devices and the applications. We don't have all the data, but we needed to start thinking about this and setting standards for the use of these devices with the notion that, of course, patient confidentiality and privacy and safety were paramount, and also knowing that patients often needed to have follow-up <coughs> plans and emergency plans, which were not always given with some of these apps. So the methods that we used to, to write the guidelines is to incorporate other recent ATA guidelines, as I mentioned earlier, uh, revise it to a more readable for, format than we had in 2007. Believe me, if you looked at the 2007 guidelines, they would really put you to sleep. Uh, we wanted to incorporate updated and graded references, and we kept this structure of shall, should, and may in terms of our, our recommendations to reflect the level of evidence that was there in the literature. Our literature review uh, went through 206 new publications which we felt were relevant and of good enough quality that we did with a PubMed re research and we used a scoring process and a recommendation strength for each of those as suggested by the American Psychiatric Association. So the guidelines addressed three aspects of service delivery, clinical, technical, and administrative. And we use these terms, shall, shall not, should, and may, to reflect the level of evidence that was there for each recommendation with respect to the literature. Shall indicates required action or adherence whenever feasible or practical. Shall not indicates a proscription or an action that's strongly advised against. Should indicates a recommended action without excluding others. And may indicates pertinent actions that may be considered to optimize the telemedicine encounter. And we wanted to be careful with this language that we try not to stifle the use of teledermatology for the delivery of care with too many rules. And you have to do that despite the way it's written. After we did this draft, and we did it over one year's time with uh, emails and teleconferences and a few in-person conferences, uh, we, this had to go then through an approval process through the American Telemedicine Academy, which is really quite rigorous. There's, a, there's actually a whole standards and guidelines committee. Um, the AT, that committee reviewed the final guidelines, and then it also went to the executive director. It was submitted for time for public comments, and we were able to integrate it with comments from the American Academy of Dermatology, for example. And then we would submit the, tra the, the draft to the board of directors, which we had the final approvement, approval. And these, in April of this year, were finally made available on the, on the website, and, and they're available to everybody. They apply to individual providers, group and specialty practices, hospitals, and healthcare systems for the use of both store and forward, live interactive, and hybrid systems. They apply mostly to people who are in the United States. The, the, the theory and the hope behind the standards and guidelines, we would like to apply over the world, but these were really written for the United States. Um, there are some other types of guidelines or position statements that are available in the United States. The, the position statement of the American Academy of Dermatology is available on their website. 
uh, and it supports the use of telemedicine services provided by board-certified dermatologists and coverage and payment for those services when several important criteria are met, which their position statement puts up. The American Medical Association has a set of guidelines for the ethical practice of telemedicine that notes that while new technologies emerge, our fundamental ethical responsibilities don't change. The Federation of State Medical Boards actually is promulgated model guidelines that says you have to place the welfare of patients first, maintain acceptable and appropriate standards of practice, adhere to recognized ethical codes governing the medical profession, and protect patient confidentiality. And those are available also online. Internationally, I didn't go through each country, and, it, and the UK obviously has the outlines we've heard about already, but there is a, 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 a um, World Health Organization associated uh, umbrella organization called the International Society for Telemedicine and eHealth, uh, which will give you more data and international guidelines. So regardless of which patient or which country we're from, we seek to deliver care in person or remotely to place the welfare of our patients first, to maintain acceptable and appropriate standards of practice, and to adhere to recognized ethical codes governing our profession. Thank you.